the sun said, give me a Land Rover. A Range Rover, not a Land Rover, a Range Rover, good one. And the father agreed to that particular promise. And it happened that when the wedding came, the father came when people are bringing gifts. I know many of you bring your beds physically, okay? The way people were doing here last Sunday, they were bringing the really salt. So this particular father, during that time, he came, the way men came for me last Sunday, they handed this young man a Bible, um, very well wrapped, the way mine was wrapped. Mine was not like that. He was wrapped very well, very good, a zipped one. We used to have a zipped one. And he gave the son. The son was not happy. He went, took the Bible, put it. So he unwrapped all the other gifts. When he unwrapped this one, he realized it was a gift. He didn't go further even to open the zip. He kept it a long period of time. Now, it came to pass that after a long period of time, the father died, and um, the young man was now going through uh, the documents to find where he can get some successor documents like title deeds. He checks everywhere, and again, he reminds himself of the gift on the wedding day. He goes, he opens the Bible, well, it was new, and he finds the key to the Range Rover. One as first son. <laughs> I don't think maybe if it was in the showroom for those many years, because the father died after very many years. I don't know what the showroom were doing. The moral story of this, the, the moral lesson of this story is that many times we do not know the gold and the lessons the Bible can unlock to our lives. While the father literally obeyed the son, and gave him the wish through the Bible, which he taught. The young man could not really know that the source of his happiness would come from the Bible. So he, this is actually, he said that this is the only thing you would give me? Yet it was, and far much better of what he wanted and what God wants in his life. Let's turn to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1. I'll read some several verses and make some inferences to both chapter 1 and chapter 2 of the book of, uh, of Past Samuel. Chapter 1, I want to read um, from verse 3. The Bible says, Year after year, this man went up from town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophin and Phinehas the two sons of Eli were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of meat to his wife, Penina, and to her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed, had closed her womb. Jump to verse 21 of chapter 1. When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer at the annual sacrifice to the Lord and fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live there always. Do what seems best for you. Her husband Elkanah told her, stay, her and stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until, he, until she had weaned him. Verse 24, after he had weaned him, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along a three-year-old bull, an ephah uh, uh, of flour and skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at, uh, at Shiloh. Uh, when we go to chapter 2 from verse 11, the Bible says, Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord uh, under Eli, the priest. This is Samuel ministering under Eli. You need to know that. Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. Now, it was the practice of the priest that whenever any of the, any of the people offered a sacrifice. The priest's servant would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand, 
while the meat was being boiled, and he would plunge the fork into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. Whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the Israelites who came to Shiloh, but even before the fat was burned, the priest servant would come and say to the person who was sacrificed, give the priest some meat to roast. He would accept the boiled meat from you, but he, would, he, he won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the person said to him, let the fat be burned first, and then take whatever you want, the servant would answer, no, hand over it now. If you don't, I will take it by force. Verse 17. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen effort. Each year, his mother made him a little robe and took, uh, and took it to him when he went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place, uh, to take the place, the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they went, then they, then they would go home. And the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and the two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Verse 22. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. So he said to them, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. If any person sins against another, God may, med may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. That is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for this word you want to minister to us. I pray that as we hear the same, you open up our eyes, oh God, our ears, oh God, spiritual eyes, spiritual ears, oh God, that we will be able to do your will in raising up our children, in shaping up them for the glory of God, that none of them would perish, oh God, out of sin of contempt or any other thing that would come out of our mission or commission, oh God. We thank you and we honor you. Today as you speak to us, Lord, I pray that you help us to understand this and do the same. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. El Sans, shaping our family spirituality. You've read this story and I know you've done it ever and ever again. Back to the story I told you, a good father that raised the children, but the children cannot read the Bible. If you put a check here, be sure that you go to America and you tell, this was your food. You come back, the check was not banked. You wonder whether it was lost. This is the story where children who were growing and serving under the Lord could not be able to get this. In just a brief, you realize that El sons actually were priests. That's what the Bible says. El himself was the high priest. If you like it, then, then Eli was the senior pastor. The others were the deputy senior pastors and many other things. But yet, this man who grew with Eli could not be able to do that. But look at Elkanah and the other one. We'll be looking at that and be able to make some lesson from that. And I believe God is going to teach something to us. Spiritual formation, which is part of uh, what we are talking about when you talk about spirituality. It's a process of forming or growing the spiritual self and that of others. So you grow. You ask yourself, am I growing in prayer? Am I growing in the things that I do for God? Many of us are used to the moments we got born again. You only pray for food. I made it as a joke on, on Wednesday. And you just pray for food very fast. 
as a moment you go. You've never gone to the moment even before food or you don't have food and you are praying for food that you eat even years to come, even for the many years. Are you growing? There's a spiritual formation that God wants us to raise in our side. It's just even before service begins, that you would come to this place and the worship team are not leading us and you are praying. I believe that that is spiritual formation of yourself and for others. In this case, we'll be talking about taking or shaping the Christian faith in our families this morning. So why is spiritual formation or shaping the family uh, spirituality important? It's because in the footstep of Jesus, he was able to do the same. Jesus, having known that he was a man of God, he used to go to the temple. The Bible says daily. I see the same even in the passage where we read that the boy Samuel ministered to God every day. He was a boy. He was not even an old man. And he would go before God every day. Why you shape the spirituality of the family is because it is in the footstep of Jesus Christ. It is the bedrock on which our faith is founded. Every Christian is known to be a person who goes on their knees, who seeks God. If you go in a place and you see people do like this, what, you know they are? Catholics. They have formed themselves to distinguish themselves. You go somewhere and you get somebody with a cap that looks like other people. You will either know that this belongs to this or the other. So, for us Christians, our faith is best on how we form that culture of going before God. Our kneeling down, our offertory, our entering the temple, our doing all that we do in Kesha, they form part and parcel of our lives. And that is supposed to be in our families. Our spirituality forms the core of our families. Why we need to do that is because in our families and we are Christians, it is that Joshua said, I and my family, we shall serve God. I see Elkanah doing the same. And I'm saying that as families draw closer to God, they draw closer to one another. We give this analogy in our marriage classes that if this was a husband, and this is the wife, and God is up there assuming at the apex, every time this man and woman goes before God, they draw close to one another. Even children, when they draw closer to one another, they draw closer to God. They draw closer to one another. Amen? I have met pastors, and I admire that to be among my three children. Don't know whether we get another one. Uh, but, but, but the three children we have, the one will be a pastor. To be my joy, to one day to see them being celebrated. While I was in the campus and I was doing theology, hey, people were introducing themselves. My father was uh, an elder. One man came and said, I have no testimony in that regard. My brother, <laughs> I pray that when we grow up, our children will grow to serve the Lord. It is the bedrock of our family. It's quite exciting. One of our pastors, the father prayed for him. He's a pastor for him to be born again. Pastor Mark Maingi is now in Nairobi Chapel. One day the father just came when they were doing all their devotion and say, he said, Father, I want to be born again. He said, I'm a pastor. I will not call another pastor. And the father led the son to Christ. These are the things we are talking about. That we can lead our families back to God. We can lead our families to God. Now, in this passage we have read, we are looking at the contracts of two fathers, Elkanah and Eli. I want us to go back there. Having said, Elkanah is being mentioned as a man that was devoted to God. And not just to God, to his family. Because the, both of them were serving in the temple. He was committed to God. And he shaped his family. Men in the house, whatever you've been giving, double it for your wives. Amen. <laughs> Elkanah in the house, the children, and they enjoyed. Quite exciting. He was devoted to God, and he was devoted to the family. Eli, he was only devoted to God. That is the contract. This man also loved the Lord. Eli loved the Lord. Woe unto you. If you love the Lord and you hate your family, woe unto you. If you love the Lord and neglect your family. One of our pastors, I will not mention his name, is still serving. But one day when they were coming for Holy Communion, you know I have three children, they are younger. We take like two hours for us to prepare to be here in the morning. So one day, the children and the wife were slow in preparation. 
So he decided to be very angry to go and ignite the vehicle. He was almost going. It was a Holy Communion Sunday. When he was almost going, the Lord said, what are you doing? Go back and call your wife. And because of that action, he'd already spoken loud. I went back and said to the wife, let's go to church. The wife said, go alone. Then he said, what will I tell the people? <laughs> when I go to serve the Holy Communion, and I have been able to make my wife and my children angry. He went back. The wife was angry. You know, you have to wait for a longer period for, for our wives or to, to cool down. You know, he was late. So he had to go back again and wait. And um, he called the deputy senior pastor and he told him, I'm coming, I'm late a little bit. And things were okay. And they went to church. Do not just be devoted to God. Let's be devoted to our family. Let's not be happy. Worship team. Be a wife. Na kimbia practice. And then, uh, you, you, no, no. There are two contrasts here. Elkana and Eli. Elkana watered his family. You can see all that he's doing. In fact, one that many of you would hear two wives. But look at what he's doing. Do the mother of Samuel. Eli did not do that. I told you he was devoted to God. At one point, God asked Eli, why did you allow this to happen? Why? Because when the sons were doing a mistake, Eli did not correct them. These were priests. They were good. God there, meet his servant. This is for the Lord. It was for the priest, the high priest. I don't know whether it was part of the, the meat that was offered, but Imondo was not part of if it was a goat. And they would go and take the fat and they eat. And the high priest was seated. He was not correcting them. The children were running up and scattered. He would not correct them. For him, he loved the Lord. And he allowed the children. They were less fair. We talked about different parenting style. He could not correct them. That is a life for you. This man loved the Lord. But he didn't see beyond that. One of the other things that comes clearly is that Elkanah modeled Christianity. He taught the habits of grace. He taught the children to give. When you allow our children to go and extend the gift in this basket, in there, we are teaching them to give. Because if they don't learn to give now, they may never give any time. And Elkanah, when he offered to say, that when I'm giving 100, but let my children give 200, but they may learn to give to the Lord. Whatever they grow up, you give them 1,000. They say, even this one should be put there. Elkanah, did that. He went and he was changing the way and the perspective in which the children were to view God. The art of the Lord, according to Elkanah, was a blessed event. In fact, at one point, now the mother catches it. He says, I will bring Samuel to the altar. Ataka hapa forever. Praise the Lord. They cannot come for prayer on Wednesday. They cannot fast. One of the things that I want to tell you this morning as we share, allow our children to fast. Um, yesterday, my, my, my wife came late and I forgot to buy snacks. So my children struggled to take tea. They were asking, what are we taking tea for? Allow them to fast. Praise the Lord. Buana sana. sana. Some of us imagine that when we do, so we serve the tea, the tea is still in the cup. We will continue. It's a story of another day. Buana sana. And many of us believe that our children should have tea with something. Where we come from, say tea is taken with two hands. Or another one like this. My friend, let us believe that children can do with tea without sugar. At one moment, as part of shaping their spirituality. Let them learn that. Let them learn that they can also take strong tea. We used to take that strong tea, which is always weak. Praise the Lord. Let's make them know that they can actually do without tea. And they can take tea and something later. It is shaping. And Samuel knew this. He knew this. And that is why when the boy Samuel was left, he doesn't complain. He ministered before the Lord on the altar. Our children dare bring them here. They will just look at you as if they are looking at a scarecrow because they have not caught the habits of grace. Eli allowed them to do whatever they were doing. When they kuja na iso fokuzao, walikuwa na ingiza, na kwanda wanachagua, wakakula indumbu. When actually the high priest was to come, and take that. And our God comes and asks them, why have you allowed this? He didn't model their behavior. We model the way of children going to the house of God. Amen? We model them how they pray. 
Looking at the lessons, I want to look at some three lessons. This will be part of it. We finish from the uh, sons of Eli, the burden of sacrifice, the burden of sin, and the power of solitude. The burden of sacrifice, which I've mentioned, the Bible says from chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, verse 4 to verse 5b, that whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of me to his wife, Penina, and to all his sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave double board portion. That was Elkanah. It was a burden. Not a burden that is heavy. But he understood that to go to worship God, it costed him something. Praise the Lord. So you wake up in the morning. Today was very cold. Thank God. But I appreciate yourself for coming to church. It was very cold. I asked myself, for some people who know how, know how to drive, would they make it to church? It's a burden. And they knew how to do it. Husbands, if you look at this, are a great Catholics of family spirituality. We have few of us that are here, if we counted by any chance, either husbands or male figure. But we are the catalysts of family spirituality. A recent study, I think I looked at it in 2019, say that for children who grew up or grow up where their fathers are born again, there are chances of them being born again and staying there is higher than those whose fathers are not born again. We are great catalysts of the children's spirituality. Amen? So for many of us who are here, let's not be like, oh, and then the mama. You know, some of us do that. Those ones that I'm addressing actually are not here. They should be here. But you can tell them when you meet them. Praise the Lord. <laughs> because they allow you to come to church. And then when I say, mama, I will come to pick you. Our prayer is, let's know that the male figure, the husbands, are great catalysts of family spirituality. Let's model it. Let's be the one convening prayer. You know, most of the times, our wives and our mothers convene that. We are great. Elkanah shows that. It was a burden that he knew. Hey, I will support my wife. And the Bible says, even his sons and daughters, he said, I would, they would go to Shiloh. Shiloh was a place of prayer. So for Elkanah, children ministry and WM, Matt. Amen. <laughs> I'm just getting home. For Elkanah, I'm Elkanah here as your pastor. Children ministry and WM matter. Praise the Lord. I'm speaking to you as church. You don't believe this. We want to make children ministry to matter. Are we together? It should not be a, a subsidiary and WM. Okay? It matter as men. Now men are the one taking it. Let's try to be like Elkanah. He knew the burden of sacrifice. Elkanah went to worship God yearly. It was a routine. He knew that burden, that every time I have and I have, he would go yearly. He made it a routine to do that. That is the burden of, of, of sacrifice. When you want to sacrifice, be consistent. Be consistent in worshiping God. Be consistent in doing the habits of grace, in fasting. Hannah, he gave him a double portion. It was a sacrifice that cost him something. I didn't put this example here. But I was reading again this lady who gave Jesus the alabaster pool of oil. Someone has computed that this person must have given a year's salary to God. It costed him something. His sons were priests, yet they did the contrary. They gave contempt to the worship God desired them. So you see, you see that difference, okay? And now you don't see them. In fact, they died younger. I'll be talking about some of the consequences of them doing that. El was a high priest. He lacked the spiritual forming on his children. You can read that from the passage. El's son had no burden in sacrifice. And thus the entire household lost the priesthood. In fact, the Bible says they were cut. The priest moved. Just imagine. Just because a family has no shepherd. Now, that means the Lord's blessings had gone from the house of Eli just because Eli did not shape that family. Man, one of, um, was one of our neighbors a long time ago, um, had a lot of wealth, 
But he didn't even teach the children how the wealth was made, how he was supervising. The day he died is when the children looked for the merchandise to buy his property. <laughs> him, he had invested for them. So in less than a year, he had gone. And somebody was making a joke, you know, but if this museum would wake up now, he would tell people, just return me there very fast. Because there is no shaping for people to take over the resources we have given them. This is it. It cuts short of the blessings of God. The burden of sacrifice. Sacrifice is at the center of our spirituality. Sacrifice of time. Um, uh, David said, I will not give God that which costs me nothing. Sacrifice of time, of resources, is what we are talking about. Is at the center of the family spirituality. Teach your children, even they go to school. I used to be the treasurer when I was in high school. And one man that I looked after, one day was just counting offering. When we were in high school, pocket money, I counted an offering of a thousand when we had no guest speaker during the past day. Somebody had given an offering. I don't know whether it's a type. When we were in high school, I used to be the treasurer. I learned in the great high school. I can tell you the year, you can check the records, but I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. That sacrifice is at the center of the children's spirituality. When they pray, don't allow your children to be like Eli's son. Let them just know they're coming to church. Let them know there's a sacrifice that comes with us being the Lord. The burden of sin of contempt. The sons of Eli are mentioned at a word place that I've read that they actually knew what was right. Even Eli himself knew, but did nothing about it. So Esa knew what was right and did not do that. Father knew also did not. But now in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 29, where we read, God asked him, why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I have prescribed for my dwelling? This is God asking Eli. Why do you honor your sons? In fact, this is God. This is not my words. You can read in your version. Why do you honor your sons more than me? By fattening yourself on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel. A question that God is asking. God is angry with this man. He knows what is right. The sons know what is right. But they're saying, this is what the Lord it should be us. And God is not happy at all, at all, about what they are going through. So he asked those questions. And I don't know what your answer to that is, but there is a burden of sin, of contact. God weighs on you, the bearer, the Christian. When you know this is belong to the Lord, na unakula. Okay? I told you I ate some hunga, the chapati, that was made elsewhere. It's not good. You will sweat when the Lord finds you eating the fat and part that belongs to him. And the Lord helps you to understand that. And even help your children to know that. That this belongs to God. Shape them. Some of us did not grow in a Christian family. I struggled to learn to give tithe. Part of it when in my leadership. I struggled. And I remember somebody, I'm telling you when you see that. I say, among this 10%, this I take to church? I struggled. But one of the things you do, you do it as a discipline. At one point, some of us were saying, do check up of our salary. Just imagine disciplining yourself. Train your children. I know some of you struggle. Your children will become easy. For us, we continue to struggle. But let's not, if we suffer, let our children live. Because Eli died at 98 years old. The children also died, not before 98 years old. That would be better. At 98, because you have not taught them, and you have taught them they live more, that's a blessing. Power of solitude. Now, Elkanah, in this context, it's a man that um, was able to observe that. The Bible contrasts and states, El signs were scoundrels. They had no regard to the Lord. But um, the other one, who is Elkanah and the family, we see in their deep anguish, they prayed to God. They wept bitterly. When you look at uh, First Samuel, a letter all. So Hannah knew the power of going up was coming down. And not him alone with their family. Eli knew that I would support them. And that was it. There is power in waiting on God. Solitude is a moment of introspection. When you are alone, you wait on God. There is power in that. But some of us don't take that very seriously. 
And I pray that God will help us to do that. I want to move very fast because of time. How do we shape the spiritual spirituality of our families? One is mentorship on spiritual disciplines. Values are caught, not just taught. For Eli, maybe as a pastor he was preaching and the sons and the wife were listening like you were listening to me. But he didn't model that. The mentorship that was supposed. So he had to do double portion. I think when the wife was saying, my husband has given me, you know the way the wife say, I made one of my friends, so my husband bought me this car that I may be going to church. He has been dropping the husband to church, the wife to church. So the other day, he bought the wife, the vehicle said, I say, now you have valued my worship and going to church. Praise the Lord. He modeled it. He did not just talk about it. So that is a way of doing. We mentor our children to pray. We allow them to do many things. We teach our spouses and children about sacrificial giving. At one moment, tell them that we are giving, we have harvested maize. This we are taking to just. Not that it is very bulky for you to carry maize in your car. But when children see it carry to charge, it's bulky. Because you would really convert it and make it 4,000, which is easy. They drop here. But make it part of it and allow them to bring yeah, as a part of worship. Double portion is a practice that he was doing it. He was teaching their spouses that I value the Lord. Teach our families about honoring God. God has been dishonored in families because many of you are husbands and maybe children, uh, spouses say, you are always going to church. Eh? You're always going to, it's like going to church is a waste of time. Hmm? Worship team, I pray for grace upon you. You know some of your spouses say, you love, you know, they, I'll tell you balance, but people will ask you, you just love going to church. Teach them to honor God, and that will be good. Teach them about fellowship. And the boy Samuel was put on the, pole, on the pulpit. Okay? It was a fellowship with God and with the other people. They used to go to Shiloh. Shiloh was a, prayer, a place of prayer. And we are having Elkanah and Eli. They are sons and the, their spouses. In fact, the spouse of Eli is not mentioned here. I need to go and do research after this. You get it? He was no modeling. He was a man showing. He had his son. The sons are mentioned for not doing what's right. You know, when you are not mentioned in this Bible, then you matter less. One as well, son. On Christmas Day, I taught you about, uh, I, I, I remember preaching here about Matthew chapter 1. Every name that is put there is very important for the kingdom. So when you miss on the vote of thanks list, you know what it means. You are just the others. How would the spouse of a high priest not be mentioned in this place? You need to ask yourself that question. Teach them about the Holy Communion. The communion with God. Approaching the altar. That was it. Sons of Eli ate what was sacred. Because there was a part that was set for the Levites. Then there's the sons of Eli. They were in contempt about the sacrifices of God. There are benefits of shaping our family spirituality. The Bible says that when you train our children the way they go, when they grow up, they will not depart from it. Many of us are struggling to follow Christ because we do not know the benefit of following Christ. And I say this maybe here or somewhere else, that when an old man gives his life, only a life comes to Christ. When our children come to Christ and know Christ, a life and a lifetime comes to Christ. Praise the Lord. So there's a greater benefit the greater benefit, a life and lifetime. But when an old man gives his life to Christ, only a life comes to Christ. It's a source of wisdom. When you read in the book of um, um, uh, Proverbs, uh, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, you say, my son, get wisdom. Okay? It's a source of wisdom. When our children grow up in the ways of God, they grow in wisdom. I taught in my previous years before I became a pastor. And one parent, I told, you, I told you it was a lucrative school. So I got some parents, some of them were not born again. But one of the child was bought a Bible by the parent who didn't know the Bible. And he told the son that please be reading Proverbs and Ecclesiastes every time and finish and come. That was a wise parent. He was not, she was not born again. She was a single man. Instructed the son to be reading that. and say, you will get wisdom. But now, this is it. That when we shape the spiritual of our families, our children will get wisdom, greater wisdom. 
They will value the things of God more than the things of the world. Number three, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and all things will be added unto you. You will actually be seeking, you will be using the right hierarchy of approaching God. We have sought the other things and then we come to God later and we struggle much. But when we go the right hierarchy, you will find that you are finding greater things, the right things, by seeking God first. So you will be able to live in what John Nganga says, a life of contentment. Our children will not live and say, I want to be so and so. Because if we don't shape them, they will grow up. They just want, they don't care the means of getting anything. They just want any way to get them. And it will be a sad way. And we're talking about family. I'm, I'm hinged more of children, maybe because I'm a children pastor. But maybe next time when I come and I stand, I become a WM pastor, I will speak also about the wife of uh, this. But this is it. That when Elkanah saw the right things, we are seeing the boys somewhere. And for many of you have read about the Bible very well. It is somewhere that when he found even Saul doing the right, the wrong thing, he said, what have you done? Look at that. It began when he was younger. You know, Saul, when people were offering, they were just, Saul was behaving like sons of Eli. He went, when he was asked now, go and sacrifice. Then he left some fat sheep. And it's Samuel who had that. And he said, God, he chose the right way. Our children would choose the right way. Because the world has a lot of shortcuts. A lot of shortcuts. But our children should not go there. And the shortcuts are leading to premature death. Praise the Lord, church. We really don't teach our children the right way. They will not live our age. Some of us are wise. I don't know how. But if our children are not the right way, they will die prematurely. They will go there, find a lot of wealth, and they will be choked. You know Numbers chapter 11? talks about the Israelites who desired great things. And they said, even, we don't want this manna. And God decided to give them meat until they were choked. Our children will get there. And we are seeing the same thing to the sons of Eli, dying prematurely just because they didn't follow God. Eli himself dying prematurely. And the priesthood and the leadership of what God has bestowed to him being cut short. Why? Because he had not obeyed the law. God is calling us to shape the spirituality of our family. That's a great benefit both to us and to them and their lifestyle. Amen? Amen. In conclusion, just one sentence I want to put across is that shaping our fam uh, family spirituality, it inspires hope and firm belief in God, the source and cause of our living. It just inspires that. It's quite simple as that. And let me tell you, we, as we live, we, this is the, the most purchased book in the world. I don't know how. At as the 21 habits of these are not bought more than this. This one, the Bible. It's because it's a source of everything. I looked at the, 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 the mentors currently. They are getting some few concepts here, but that they are distorting. And they are shaping the way the world will be led. If we would allow our children to stand on the word of God and do what is right, they know that God will direct. We're going to have a generation that will stand up one day and God say, we thank you for your parents. We thank you for our forefathers. We thank you for the people that mentored you. But if we don't do that, our generation will be cut short. It will be cut short before any calamity or any pandemic. Because the other pandemic that now the health uh, tip of the week didn't tell us is the pandemic of not teaching our children the ways of the law. A greater pandemic because it finishes the sons of Eli and Eli himself. In a short while, they will be gone without you getting any precautions, any remedy. The remedy is us to shape the ways of approaching the kingdom of God. They're doing the right things of God. Doing and sacrificing to God because it matters. Amen? I want to pause there. I ask you to pray for yourself. Pray for your family. Maybe they're here or they're at home. Some of the people that live around you as Pastor Patrick comes to do a benediction for us, pray for them that God is visiting you in a special way and just help you to shape 
If you've been struggling in any area, make it easy that the children, when they come to the age like yours, they will not struggle to say, I can wait to get a spouse. You know, some of them are not even trusting that they can wait, they can abstain. They can't because life for them is just usual of the world because you have not taught them. They will know that approaching the kingdom of God and giving an offering, I will just do it effortlessly because I know it belongs to God and God expects that.